Hello, listener. So I've been reading about the Hellenistic period, and the, from the Hellenistic period, I dove into reading back some uh, Christian theology in the Bible, and I'm going to torture you with uh, my um, conclusions about that today. So what I kind of want to discuss is three big things, but uh, starting with uh, the conquest of Alexander the Great, because it's interesting how in when you learn about classical period what you learn about mostly is the classical period and you learn about the Peloponnesian War and so on and then you learn about the conquest of Alexander the Great but what happens after that usually doesn't get so much attention at least you know in normal middle school I haven't studied I haven't taken the courses in classics so I don't know really know what they teach there and I imagine it differs between universities at any rate but the Hellenistic period which is the period that came after the conquest of Alexander the Great is actually in, in the most interesting in my opinion because that's where a lot of the philosophy and mathematics and developments that we attribute to the Greeks were actually developed and a lot of that had to do with the conquest of Alexander the Great, because what Alexander the Great did is he basically unlocked the east to, to the Oikmen, to the Mediterranean world, uh, because there had been sort of a cultural barrier there, and because of differing uh, cultures, there wasn't so much communication between the two, and he sort of unlocked that. Um, and he himself didn't really play much of a role in that. I mean, he spent 20 years conquering the Persian Empire, famously stopped in India, then died and his successors warred with each other and a few kingdoms developed and the easternmost kingdom that developed was the greco-bactrian kingdom and the greco-bactrian kingdom is interesting because they ruled over parts of what is today india and though they also ruled over afghanistan parts of what is today russia and even with the bordering with china they even interacted with the chinese in fact an interesting thing is that this Greco-Bactrian kingdom, which had a Greek elite and, of course, a non-Greek general population, the elite at some point converted to Buddhism. What I find interesting is that they reintroduced Buddhism back to the Mediterranean world. Now, firstly, Buddhism is interesting in and of itself because it was probably founded by in an Indo-European. The Buddha was a descendant of the Indo-Europeans that invaded the Indian subcontinent some 2,000 years before Christ or so. The exact dates are sort of uncertain because we don't have very good geological and genetic data, but we know that it happened. Mm. Uh, especially today, we've got definitive proof of it through genetic testing. Uh, it's a sensitive topic in India, actually, because they don't like that a lot of what is considered Indian culture could be attributed to these Indo-European invaders. I say Indo-European because that's sort of the politically correct term. Traditionally, they were called Aryans. We also sometimes use the term Yamnaya to refer to the Western branch. Anyway, they inspired a lot of things that we consider to be typically Indian today. The Vedas, Sanskrit, and Buddhism. And the Buddha was probably an Indian prince. So these sorts of uh, Buddhist ideas were developed from, oh well, Aryan tribes. And they flow back to the Mediterranean world through the Greco-Bactrian kingdom and due to the conquest of Alexander. And there they inspire Stoicism. So you know of Citium develops Stoicism. And Stoicism has a lot of similar ideas to Buddhism. Not in a direct way. It's not like someone handed, uh, you know, a copy of... Um, Buddhist philosophy to Zeno of Sitium and he thought, oh, this is a fantastic idea. Let me imitate this in my philosophy. That's not quite how it worked. It took decades and it went through sort of cultural osmosis where some ideas spread, shared, and the source sort of gets lost and a lot of the forms get lost. But, so, you know, it, those ideas that are popular are transmitted. It's how almost all ideas function, really. Maybe that's changed now with computers and better record keeping, but in the past, things were shared more orally, and so through osmosis, things were communicated. And Zeno of Citium developed Stoicism. At the same time, Buddhism also enters Judea together with Greek culture. Um, so the, the Hebrew people of Judea split into two big factions, the Hellenized Jews and the traditional Jews. And this is important in inspiring Christianity because the Hellenized Jews start incorporating Stoicism and Neoplatonism and Buddhism into their philosophy. And they sort of directly, uh, they're the ideological fathers of Jesus Christ. Jesus is uh, part of the Hellenized tradition of Judaism. And what he preaches, you can see, is more similar to Buddhism, more similar to Stoicism uh, than traditional Judaism, which is a, more, a much more tribalistic sort of, 
not animistic because it is monotheistic and it doesn't attribute things to spirits or anything but it's more pro a somewhat more primitive religion and it is much more might makes right sort of philosophy very different from the more developed ideas that judaism develops from the hellenized period onward and an interesting example of this hellenization is for example the story of samson which is interesting because the story of samson is probably either an imitation or a parody of the story of hercules now there may have been a historical samson there probably was because the hebrew uh, bible the old testament is just a sort of semi-mythologized record keeping of the history of the tribes of israel so there probably was a historic Samson, but he probably wasn't anything like the story in the Old Testament, where he's a super strong figure that can kill lions with his bare hands and a thousand men with a jawbone of an ass. Probably not. And he's probably, so the theory why he could be an imitation is because, well, he follows a lot of the same feats of strength and so on of Hercules. Why he could be a parody is because, well, he beats people to death with a jawbone of an ass. He gets, he has an ironic death, loses his eyes. He's sort of an immoral lustful figure like hercules was because how is hercules brought down hercules dies because he couldn't keep his in his pants basically uh, which is the fate of a lot of greek heroes and gods and demigods greeks have a bit of a perverse streak to them in in classical antiquity and in the hellenistic period too so it could be either an imitation or a parody at any rate that's an example of how judaism gets hellenized and this Hellenization that leads to Christianity. Then, of course, if you want to look at the history of it, um, Jesus, of course, preaches uh, his teachings, gets killed. The apostles go and spread it, not to the east, but to, to the Mediterranean. They go to Greece and Rome, not just to the Corinthians. Paul gets crucified in Rome. Uh, and in that time, Stoicism has become the most prevalent philosophy in the Roman Empire because the Romans adopted it. And a lot of, uh, one of the most famous stoics is of course marcus aurelius who wasn't himself really good stoic. if you read the meditations he's basically constantly arguing with himself that he should be a better man more moral and stick more to stoic principles uh, but he's a very famous uh, stoic writer cato the elder proudly stoic the whole sort of patrician culture was to be stoic uh in in rome and that's why i think why christianity was easy to adapt there because it fitted quite well with um with uh, stoic values at least parts of christianity and this development carries on of course neoplatonism and stoicism get merged more with christianity and the judaic elements get left more behind to the point where the old testament today for example is mostly not taught by a lot of denominations because it's too violent and uh eye for an eye hammurabi sort of thing isn't really most modern christians don't like that sort of thing and it's not really relevant to a lot of what christian theology has developed in terms of ideas because christian theology is interesting because it develops a concept of natural law which is very important in the development of natural science uh, and of course it has uh, ideas of the omnipresence of god which is interesting if you go into quantum physics and you go to for example how matter relates to it how electrons hold to themselves it gets pretty complex but it's interesting that some christian theological ideas are quite similar to modern quantum physics in a sense but that's something i should work out more and make a separate video on about at some point but at any rate it, it's what what interests me is that you can have this linear sort of way from alexander the great who just has his own ambitions and things and seems unrelated in a very distant past but because of his actions you know buddhism gets reintroduced to the to to the to the west and the west plays with those ideas develops their own things they influence judaism judaism influenced stoicism influence rome develops christianity christianity develops things like natural law uh, another philosophical co and theological concept which allowed the development of sort of the scientific method and then you get the industrial revolution and we get to where we are today so things that seem unrelated can have very these long processes which is why wh one of the things i say very often is that the everything is just change of logic change and change of logic there isn't coincidence and there isn't unpredictability it's just there is no there is no processor big enough and no data storage big enough to make good enough predictions based on all the data because the world is far too complex for that but theoretically it's possible
theoretically you could pre- you could predict if you take an asteroid you could theoretically predict everything that that asteroid will collide with and be nearby how it will interact with every object throughout its entire existence but you'd need a, a computer that's impossibly big and impossibly complex so it's just not a feasible thing with the technology we have today which is what gets me into the whole thing of evolution and uh, and so on my thing always is that the only logical purpose of consciousness can be to understand the nature of the universe, to understand everything. And that's where where I get into a second thing I want to talk about, which is also related to Christianity, which is John Milton's Paradise Lost and the Faustian Spirit. And this is a concept I've been working on. And maybe I should do a separate video, but I've made a video in the past about John Milton's Paradise Lost and how he's very interesting and, and very influential on European thinking, more than he's given credit for, because in my opinion, Paradise Lost sort of translates a lot of the psychology of the Northern European Protestant culture. Because what, jo- what John Milton does in Paradise Lost is he is justifying how you can revolt against god in what circumstances can you revolt against the natural order why you you know because satan is sort of the anti-hero and the reason he writes it in this way is because he himself is a regicide well he didn't kill the king himself but he was a supporter of the regicide cromwell so he and and god of course was uh, or the king was ordained by god so he's trying to make a moral argument for in which cases you can revolt against god and that is if of course god and therefore nature is unjust and then you get into complex ideas of what justice is, of course. But he writes in Paradise Lost, he basically rewrites Genesis from the perspective of Satan. What Satan does, why he does it. And um, it's a lot of arguments about free will. And it's a lot of arguments about morality in there. And it's very interesting to read because I think it is the fundamental inspiration for quite a lot of our more modern thinking in the West, especially liberalism. But that's what he does anyway. And what I find interesting in in the sense of the Faustian spirit is that Satan sort of represents the Faustian spirit in in Paradise Lost. Because what is the Faustian spirit? Well, you probably know what the origin is. The Faustian spirit is a reference to Goethe, to to his play Faust and the folktales that preceded it. And my name is Faust. It's not a... That's my real name. It's just a coincidence that it happens to be related to such topics. It's just a Germanic name that my father decided to give me. So I'm not called after Goethe's play or anything like that. That's unrelated. But the, uh, the inspiration is this figure, Faust, who is a scientist, an alchemist, who wants to understand the nature of the universe. He wants to know everything. So he makes a bargain with uh, Satan that he gets eternal life, giving him, in theory, enough time to study everything and understand the universe. But of course, he gets melancholic and he loses purpose and he die and he decides to make a bargain anyway for love and some versions just depression, and it which is in my opinion a very weak ending. But anyway, that's on un- that's unimportant. The point is the Faustian spirit is this drive to try and understand everything, to know everything. Spengler calls this a, a typical European way of thinking: the Faustian spirit as opposite to the Magian spirit, which is the Eastern sort of more complacent spirit in Spengler's writing. And in, Sp- in Spengler's opinion. The Faustian spirit is what marks Europeans out as being fairly unique because we always want to know what's beyond the hill. We want to un- know what is be- what the stars are. We want to navigate the stars and understand the universe. And that's why where I get into this thing with consciousness. The only logical thing that consciousness can do is to try and understand everything, like the Faustian spirit. The point, is, the thing is, if you try and understand everything, you basically become God. If you understand everything, then you have also control over everything. So you would, if you understand the entire universe, you have control over everything in the universe, which essentially makes you God, or as near as to God, which is going back to Satan. What is, does Satan do in Paradise Lost? He has his own ideas about creation. He has his own ideas about redesigning the universe. So in a sense, Satan in Paradise Lost is the embodiment of the Faustian spirit. He wants to become God. He wants to equal or achieve over God or change God's creation, which changing God's creation is, if you just say God is nature, we are constantly changing nature to suit our needs as Europeans uh, with technology. Sometimes that produces inadvertent results and we, in a sense, produce evil. For example, you could say pollution is an inadvertent evil that we commit as Europeans. And Satan is kind of depicted in that same way in in Paradise Lost. It's not that Satan is himself by nature evil, 
it is that because he doesn't really fully understand creation, because he doesn't fully understand God's plan, he revolts and he creates inadvertent effects, such as, for example, causing the fall of man from paradise to sin to become simple mortals, which is part of, for example, John Milton is where Satan argues with God after the fall of man, after he's become the snake and tempted Eve into eating the apple, he argues with God. Which, where he says, why are you punishing them? I'm the tempter, you know, you're punishing both of them, only one of them really committed the, the voluntary act, and is it really even a voluntary act because I'm the one who tempted them into it? Is this not my sin rather than theirs? And goes into this argument about free will. Because Satan feels somewhat guilty about causing man to fall. He wanted to spoil God's creation, but when he does it, he's kind of, he's sorry that he did it. And, and that's, I feel very, that's very European in my feeling. Anyway, it's something I'm still working on, this idea of Paradise Lost Satan's Satan's representation of European Faustian spirit. And what I also find interesting is, of course, the fall, because Satan, of course, casts down, gets cast down from the heavens. And if you read your Spengler, you get civilizational circles of civilization, spring, summer, fall, and eventually winter and death. So every civilization has this circle. The thing I disagree with with Spengler and many of these others is that uh, despite that being an observable phenomenon, every civilizational cycle still leaves things behind that allow it to be more developed. When the Bronze Age collapse hell, uh, occurred, we didn't fall all the way back to being hunter-gatherers. A lot of technology was still preserved in the minds of people, and even though the general level of technology fell and institutions were destroyed, religions were destroyed, that was all built back up and the level of technology was still somewhat preserved. And when this is with every collapse. When Rome fell, we didn't completely collapse back into the Bronze Age. No, we still kept a lot of the technology. Just the empire was gone and the religion was gone, substituted by Christianity. So the institutions get destroyed in civilizational cycles, but the people, the genes, and a lot of the ideas don't. And you can trace this all the way back through the natural world. If you take all of the development of life, you go from amino acids to today. Well, at first you get plants, you get amino acids, then you get enzymes, and you eventually you get mosses. Mosses develop into ferns, and they develop a vascular system. Trees develop. Uh, they develop branches, leaves, and, and they get more and more complex to the point where now for a few hundred million years, we've had the finished product, the tree where there isn't much ways it can improve anymore. And the same thing with animals, you go from invertebrate, single cell vertebrates to complex, more and more complex until you get to humans and humans are the first animal to develop fully conscious self-awareness sentience. And we're probably just a step in that process because in, an, in a uh, determinist and fundamental un universe, the probability of everything approaches one, but there will be a point where we will have a consciousness that understands everything and that consciousness in a sense will be more or less tantamount to being god and we're just one step in the process and we'll evolve away improve upon ourselves develop something new such as ai for example but that process is always ongoing of evolution evolution never stops and well these sorts of things is what i find interesting these long sh it, you know as you absorb knowledge you can reincorporate all this stuff into what you already know making more sense of what you know philosophically mechanically everything you know it's what i spend most of my time on just reading stuff and it's interesting how f you go and go from alexander the great and to all this complex stuff we have today where it, without alexander the great there would still be a probable probability would still be one that we would eventually achieve this point but you can look at that point in the chain developing all the way over here and without the point in the chain we wouldn't be in exactly the same place the exactly same way because it could have developed in other ways because the core ideas of everything are unchangeable because there are fundamental things in the universe that are unchangeable but forms can be different it, instead of christianity it could have had a lot of the same core ideas but instead we would have a more developed form of stoicism perhaps or uh, rather than having a Judaic element, which at this point has become less and less relevant in it, uh, it could have just been Neoplatonism, could have just been continuing on from the Greeks. However, the Buddhist aspect of it is, is, is somewhat important in developing these ideas. And it's also interesting how these ideas sort of cycle around and take time to go from one place and back to the other. And then in isolation, they develop in, in one direction, get re reconnected with others, synthesis, it's kind of Hegelian, you know, you get your 
thesis uh, antithesis synthesis which is sort of the process how most things work if you look at for example self-learning programming that's basically all you're doing is constant thesis antithesis synthesis where hypotheses get, are for example if you're programming a robot to learn to follow a straight line it will do a hundred thousand attempts and and every attempt you give it an input whether it's more or less correct and will correct every which is basically a, a thesis antithesis synthesis method which is seemingly mostly how most things and how evolution fundamentally works anyway this is just a big rant about interesting uh, things i found interesting about uh, incorporating new knowledge into existing knowledge and some stuff about christianity and uh how christianity meshes actually quite well with some things in physics and how you can't ignore things in the past just because we are more advanced now or whatever because they were still fundamental in developing these things today and they can still provide insights by looking back and retreading the information because as quantum physics advances more and more concepts from traditional theological christianity become more and more relevant and interesting and it's worthwhile to look at that in terms of philosophy and when you incorporate theology technology it has social implications and so on and so on anyway that's what i wanted to talk about Wait.